Hello and welcome to Astronomy with Mr Gerin. Today we're going to talk about optical telescopes. We use telescopes to observe the sky in all parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, but this video will focus on using visible light. We'll start by learning how the naked eye works. Then we'll look at the structure and physics of different types of telescope. We'll talk about the advantages and disadvantages of each type and learn about the numbers used to describe them, essential if you're thinking of buying a telescope. And finally, we'll discuss the enhanced appearance of various astronomical objects when using a telescope. First, let's look at the human eye in astronomy. The eye is an organ that collects and processes light, although most of the processing is done in the brain. To be effective, it needs to collect an appropriate amount of light, and it does this through the pupil, a dark circular region. The pupil is actually transparent. It appears black because light enters the eye through it and is absorbed by the retina at the back of the eye. In daytime, the pupil is about 2-4mm to four millimeters across, limiting the light it collects to protect the retina from being overloaded. But in the dark, it expands to about twice that size, to make the most of the limited light available. The amount of light the pupil takes in is called its light grasp, and is, more or less, the area of the pupil. We'll talk more about this later when we discuss telescopes. The area of a circle is proportional to its radius squared, so doubling the width of the pupil lets it take in four times as much light. This makes it easier to see faint objects, like stars, at night. At the back of the eye, light lands on the retina. The retina is covered in photoreceptors, cells which react to light and send signals to the brain. These come in two types named for their shape. Rods, shown here in black, are very sensitive to light, making them useful in low light situations, but can't distinguish colours. Cones can distinguish colour, but need a lot of light to work, so they don't work well in low light. There are three types of cone for the three primary colours, red, green and blue. This is a bit of a simplification, but it's good enough for the astronomy GCSE. In naked eye astronomy, the light levels are very low, so you mostly use only rod cells. This makes it hard to see colours, except for bright objects such as Mars, which appears slightly red. You can see this effect easily for yourself. Next time you wake up at night, look around the room, You'll probably be able to see where things are, but you won't see their colours, except for bright LEDs, like those you get on phone chargers. The central part of the retina, the part you use to look directly at things and focus on them, is packed with cone cells, giving you excellent vision in a small part of the eye. This is called the fovea, and you use this for seeing detail, like when you read. But with all those cone cells, there isn't much room for rod cells. It's hard to see faint objects, such as when you're doing naked eye astronomy. But if you look slightly to the side of the object you're observing, the light from it will land away from the fovea, where there are more rod cells, and you'll see the object more clearly. This technique is called averted vision. Human eyes adapt to different light levels, but this takes time, about half an hour to adapt to darkness from bright light. This is called dark adaptation. But dark adaptation is very quickly undone. A brief glance at a mobile phone screen or torchlight on the ground is enough to reset your eyes. When observing at night, don't check your phone. However, rod cells are less sensitive to red light than blue or green. So if you need to use a light source, use a red light, such as a low-power rear bike light. Most astronomy phone apps have a night mode, which only uses red light. Remember to turn this mode on before you start your observing session. But also, remember that this won't stop the bright white light of an alert coming through. You can buy a red acetate filter to place on your phone screen, and you might want to turn on airplane mode while observing. Ever wondered why pirates wear eye patches? It's not because they scratched their eye with their hook hand, it's to protect their dark adaptation. If you go from the bright sunlit deck to the dark of below decks, you'll have no dark adaptation. So before electric lighting, sailors would wear a patch over one eye. Below decks, they'd flip the patch up and use their dark adapted eye to see. When going back on deck, they'd flip it down to protect their dark adaptation. Although historians haven't found any direct evidence for this, Mythbusters proved that it works well. And lastly, before we talk about telescopes, we should discuss factors that affect visibility that you should consider when planning your observations. You should consider rising and setting times. There's no point trying to observe Orion in June, for example, when it's in the daytime sky. See my video, Objects in the Sky, Motion of Objects in the Sky, for more on this. Of course, you need to check the weather forecast, you don't want to set everything up if it's too cloudy. Check the landscape, preferably before you go with all your equipment, 
in case trees, buildings or hills are going to block your vision, particularly for objects near the horizon. And, perhaps less obviously, seeing conditions. This refers to the turbulence of the atmosphere above you, which can distort the view of faint objects. On screen, you can see a star in very good seeing conditions on the left, and getting worse to the right. Use the website Meteo Blue, link on screen and in the video description, for a forecast of seeing conditions. A seeing index of 5 is excellent, while 1 is poor. So why use a telescope? Telescopes magnify distant objects, but that's not their main purpose in astronomy. They are designed to gather more light and make those faint objects appear brighter. Remember we talked about light grasp? This tells us how much light a device can gather, and we usually use it as a comparison, given as a multiple or ratio. For instance, a telescope might have a light grasp 100 times the human eye, or one telescope might have 1.5 times the light grasp of another. Light grasp is proportional to the area of the objective element, and proportional to the square of the diameter of the objective element. You can make the most basic telescope with just two lenses. The objective element is a lens or mirror which gathers light. The larger it is, the better, as this will increase the light grasp. The eyepiece is a smaller lens which focuses the light, so a human eye or an electronic detector can see it. Of course, a proper telescope also has a body, called a barrel or tube. This holds the rest of the telescope together and blocks out undesired light from the sides. Galileo Galilei is often credited with inventing the telescope. He didn't, but he did improve the design and was the first to use one for astronomy in 1609. The Galilean refracting telescope has two lenses, a large convex lens for the objective element and a smaller concave lens for the eyepiece. Here you can see the path of light rays through a Galilean telescope. You don't need to draw ray diagrams like this for the GCSE. A Galilean refracting telescope produces an upright image, which makes aiming and observing very easy. Johannes Kepler improved Galileo's design by replacing the concave eyepiece with a convex one. This allows for a greater field of view and a greater magnification. Unlike the Galilean telescope, a Keplerian refracting telescope also allows the focus to be adjusted. However, as you can see here, the light rays cross over, producing an inverted image. This isn't always a problem, but if you want an upright image, you'll need an additional lens. Refracting telescopes use a lens as their objective element. Isaac Newton was the first to construct a reflecting telescope, which has a curved mirror instead. To see the reflected light, the observer would have to stand in the way of incoming light. So Newton added a plane mirror to reflect light to the side, and placed the eyepiece there. Mirrors are shown here in green, while the eyepiece lens is shown in blue. The objective mirror is called the primary mirror, and the plane mirror is the secondary mirror. The ray diagram is a little more complex for a reflecting telescope. Our last type of telescope is an improvement on Newton's design, by Laurent Cassegrain, a Catholic priest. This telescope uses a similar concave primary mirror but the secondary mirror is a convex mirror that reflects light back towards a hole in the primary mirror, where we find the eyepiece. The ray diagram shows that this telescope will produce an inverted image. Here we can see a summary and comparison of these four telescope designs. Remember, they all gather a large amount of light and focus it onto a small area, usually a human eye or an electronic instrument such as a camera. Each telescope design has advantages and disadvantages, but almost all modern, professional and high-end amateur telescopes are reflectors, as these have significant advantages over refractors. Lenses refract different colours by slightly different angles. This causes a distortion of the image, called chromatic aberration. On the photo of the pendant, you can see purple and green regions where the camera's primary lens has refracted different wavelengths of light by different amounts. Mirrors reflect all wavelengths at the same angle, preventing this effect. By using multiple mirrors, we can use the same part of the telescope's tube multiple times. In our Cassegrainian example, light passes through one part of the telescope three times. This lets us use a primary mirror with a longer focal length, which in turn allows greater magnification at the eyepiece. And some telescope designs use even more mirrors. And finally, reflectors allow us to use much larger aperture objective elements. Large glass lenses are heavy and fragile. They need to be supported on only their edges, and their weight can make them sag, distorting the image, or even fracture. 
Mirrors are generally lighter as they are thinner. We can also support them on their entire reverse side, not just the edges. This lets us use much larger objective elements and gather much more light. The largest reflecting objective piece in the Grand Telescopio is 10.4 meters across, while the largest refracting objective piece in Yerkes Observatory is just one tenth that size at 1.02 meters across. Now we'll consider some of the numbers used to describe the quality and structure of telescopes, before finally looking at the visual enhancements telescopes give to common astronomical objects. Understanding these numbers is very important if you're considering buying a telescope, but I also recommend buying the latest issue of a quality astronomy magazine, which always have reviews of the latest telescopes to help you choose what's best for you and your budget. We've already discussed the diameter of the objective element. This is called its aperture. You also know that the light grasp is the area of the objective element, which tells us how much light the telescope can collect. These two are calculated in a few different ways, and if you Google these terms, expect to be confused by photographers, filmmakers and astronomers giving different explanations. But these definitions are good enough for us. Field of view, or FOV, is the angle of the sky that a telescope can observe at once. It is measured in degrees or arc minutes, and it depends on the area of the objective element and the telescope's magnification. A larger objective element increases the field of view, but a larger magnification reduces the field of view. Magnification is the apparent increase in angular size of objects as viewed through the telescope. For example, a magnification of 10 times means objects will appear 10 times as large as they would with the naked eye. The magnification equation, given to you in the GCSE exam, is magnification equals FO divided by FE, where FO is the focal length of the objective element, and FE is the focal length of the eyepiece. Test yourself with this example. My telescope has an eyepiece with focal length 25mm and an objective lens with focal length 200mm. What is its magnification? Pause the video and try this. Magnification equals 200mm divided by 25mm, giving 8 times magnification. And lastly, resolution. This is an angle measured in arc seconds. Lower numbers are better. We can resolve, or distinguish between, details in the sky if the angle between them is more than our angle of resolution. If the angle between details, such as two stars or two bands in Jupiter's atmosphere, is less than our angle of resolution, we won't be able to tell them apart. The human eye has a resolution of about 20 arc seconds while the Hubble Space Telescope has a much better resolution of 0.1 arc seconds. Resolution depends on many things, but these are the most important. Resolution is inversely proportional to the aperture size. If you double the aperture size, resolution is halved, which is better. And longer wavelengths of light increase the resolution. It's hard to distinguish details in longer infrared than in shorter visible light. So, lower resolutions are better. But... A smaller angle of resolution is actually referred to by astronomers as a higher resolution, for no good reason that I've ever understood. So, if you're comparing telescope A with a resolution of one arc second, with telescope B with a resolution of two arc seconds, telescope A is clearly better. But, if you're asked what astronomers might look for when buying a telescope, say higher resolution. Here you can see the effects of resolution. On the left, you can see that as two stars get closer together, they become impossible to distinguish when they are closer than the telescope's resolution. On the right, you can see Jupiter, viewed at high resolution, and a much fuzzier image at low resolution. And finally today, we'll look at how telescopes improve the visual appearance of objects in the night sky. The Milky Way appears to the naked eye as a faint white band across the sky. But a telescope will show you many individual stars, Look at the Milky Way if you want to see thousands of stars. A single star appears to the naked eye as a point of light. Through a telescope, it will appear brighter and possibly sharper. Binary stars orbit each other. They are all too close together to be distinguished with the naked eye. But a telescope can let you resolve the two or more separate stars. Double stars appear next to each other in the sky, but are actually separated by many light years. A well-known example is Alcor and Mizar in the Big Dipper. Through a telescope, 
they'll appear further apart, and you'll be able to see more stars, sometimes making it hard to figure out which stars you were actually looking for. An open cluster appears as a fuzzy patch of light, maybe with a few individual stars. With a telescope, you'll see many more individual stars. With the naked eye, a globular cluster just looks like a small, faint, round blur. Through a telescope, you'll realise they're actually made up of many individual stars. A nebula appears to the naked eye as a faint, barely visible blur. Through a telescope, you'll be able to make out the shapes and hopefully colours of the nebula. Andromeda is the only major galaxy visible to the naked eye, except our own, looking like a faint grey blur in good conditions. Through a telescope, you can see much more detail, including structures like its spiral arms. Here are a few summary screens for what we've learned today. In a future video, I'll discuss other telescopes, including radio and infrared astronomy. Thank you for watching. Goodbye, and have an excellent day.